Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and we do have uh, some very serious things that have been happening here over the last uh, two days. Uh, actually, I got this from Lorenzo and already happened originally. And what you're seeing here uh, on your screen and behind you, uh, this is Russia uh, moving. Uh, an entire battalion of intercontinental ballistic missiles down to the uh, southern part, central Russia there. Uh, this location, Altai, uh, Altai is uh, closer to Mongolia, but it's right where Russia, the two countries come together down in there uh, to where China's border meets it there. Uh, and, I, and just like the Chinese, uh, the Russia doesn't feel that there was a threat by the Chinese moving nuclear uh, or at least intercontinental ballistic missiles near their border on the northeastern side of China. I don't think China feels a threat from Russia either. Uh, and, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that these uh, nuclear uh, missiles that are being moved, you cannot help but wonder if they're not being staged down in this area for a possible uh, greater conflict that could spread globally uh, and yet putting these missiles within reach of the Middle East uh, with any possible adversaries that Russia would feel that would be a threat to their own national security. Uh, this did happen, though, right after we saw the uh, uh, Miss Haley, the new United Nations ambassador for the United States, uh, make the comment that Russia has to give up Crimea in order to have the sanctions lifted. Um, that was didn't seem that it was going to be on the plate originally from President Donald Trump when he had the conversation with Russia. It seemed to be a very positive, upbeat conversation, but that since has seemed to uh, change a bit in scope. Uh, just have to wait to see what's going to happen on that. Uh, another very serious uh, news here I wanted to share with you, Mikhail D., uh, has posted a chart from the Kremlin's website on his Twitter account. It says, keep your eyes peeled on Belarus this year. As soon as you see the words, exercise Zapod 2017, know that something bad could happen. Zapod, by the way, is the Russian word for West. Um, now, does that mean Western uh, uh, Russia or the West border, whatever the case may be, or could that deal with the West and the buildup of troops that they have uh, all along Russia's border, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Of course, right to the south of these countries here is Belarus, which is a partner of Russia. Belarus seen many, many um, uh, changes of power over the course of its history. Uh, major uh, events have happened. During the Second World War, many of the Jews were killed. In fact, the largest number of Jews ever killed in one day was killed in Belarus um, from Hitler when he came into there. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, the Bielski family, uh, Michael Bielski, his father rescued uh, some uh, some 1,100 plus Jews during that time. Him and his brothers there. The book I wrote, uh, Yom Suf, the uh, Israel's final exodus. I actually go into details about Belarus. Um, Anyway, though, what I want to bring out about the chart, though, that he speaks about is the railway carriages sent by Russian Ministry of Defense to Belarus. Uh, you look at uh, 2013, there were 200, 2014, there were 90, 2015, 125, and 2016, only 50 uh, rail cars. That's train car, you know, like a flatbed car, for example, uh, that could hold a couple of tanks or whatever the case may be. It could be a, uh, a car that carries ammo, missiles, etc. But in 2017, and we've only had uh, not even two months yet, uh, we're just talking about January and part of February, 4,162 train cars have been sent into Belarus by the Defense uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, Russia, for what they called Exercise Zapad. It is supposed to happen in 2017. There is no announced date. Uh, we have also increased troop movement by Germany as well into the uh, Baltic areas. Uh, we have all these troops in Poland, and there is major concern that this could escalate uh, out of control. Uh, I hope that's not the case. Um, you know, there are a lot of things going on. Also in the United States, President Trump is facing a major uh, issues there with the unrest, the protests that are going on now. A federal judge lifts his ban that he has placed in by an executive order 
uh, allowing the immigrants to come in. Uh, recently, I saw where President Trump tweeted on Twitter here that uh, he had stated that it's a shame that they can just lift the ban that he puts out there uh, and allow anyone to come into the country. Uh, but there's a lot of protest against President Trump for this. Uh, so Trump slams the court's ruling as ridiculous. Uh, the U.S. spends the, the travel ban. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has said it will stop flagging travelers from the countries under the Trump administration's travel ban following a federal judge's ruling to suspend the executive order. That concerns me as far as seeing a power struggle in the United States. Uh, when you see the president make an executive order and then a federal judge overrides that order, it makes you wonder who's really in power in the country. And I'm sure that's not just going to go away easily either. Uh, <clears throat> in other news as well, <coughs> uh, Ukraine has quietened down uh, for, for a very short while, I might add, uh, I did not remember to leave this uh, article up earlier that I, I should have brought up there. But uh, there is in Ukrainian news, uh, Petro Poroshenko has promised to bring a very long war against Donbass, the eastern uh, part of Ukraine where the, uh, uh, Donba, uh, the Donetsk people and Luhansk people's republics uh, who are trying to declare autonomy, uh, where the, the Minsk agreement is, is called a ceasefire when they could not uh, take these regions back under their control. They have since been more of a separatist uh, area. Russia has helped back them uh, with arms and supplies uh, to fight for their own self-defense. And, uh, uh, of course, now Petro Poroshenko is vowing to take Donbass back one way or the other. Um, so I'm very concerned that we're going to see an air campaign before it's over with by Ukraine, which is against the Minsk agreements. Uh, and we know they're not keeping a whole lot of uh, things to begin with. If you look on your screen right here, I think it's important to note, um, this is the OSCE. These are the international monitors there in Ukraine. Uh, they sit there and watch as uh, in regular neighborhoods as the Ukrainian uh, government uh, just brings the tanks right on in. Uh, there was another one that I had earlier where the uh, one of the Ukrainian commanders is talking to one of the OSC guys. They, they show the photographs of it, everything, uh, where people have photographed them talking to them. Uh, and I do know it's tit for tat when it comes to their tanks and stuff being in there. But this is one of the main reasons why we titled the video the way we did, because now Russia is, uh, I say Russia, uh, the Donetsk People's Republic, they have really brought in their tanks as well. Uh, you can't say it's a residential area where they're sitting at. They look like they're sitting beside a factory uh, where they got them close there. I think there's, let's see, there's three, four, five, six, seven, seven tanks that we can see in the picture right here. Uh, the, the comment on the page here says, breaking the, well, SHIT going to hit the fan for Ukraine. Uh, NAV deployed has bad AWS tanks. Time is up. You crops stop shelling or face extinction. Uh, so they're not playing games. And I can't say that Russia has shipped in extra tanks here recently. Uh, this is no doubt part of the tanks that were shipped in back uh, in, in response to the July buildup of Ukrainian uh, 40 plus tanks, which we later found out were 41 tanks that the Ukrainians built up on the contact line of Donetsk in July that we reported on ourselves, uh, and then Russia sent in another 20 some odd tanks uh, as well to to help uh, the people of the Donetsk Republic there to defend themselves against the aggression coming from Ukraine. Uh, a lot of uh, Western journalists call it Russian aggression. I see it more as Ukrainian aggression. And this is something mainstream media is not telling the people. It has been a, uh, it, was, it was Ukraine that, that ignited this offensive against the Donetsk people. Uh, they made headway. They crossed even the, uh, the, the line that had been drawn during the Minsk agreement, taking territory from them. Uh, you know, which some would argue that Ukraine has that right, but then again, you got to remember it was a coup that overthrew the legitimate government, was, which was uh, President Viktor Yanukovych. So I have to kind of question some of these here. Um, another uh, thing I think that's really important to bring out, uh, 
Lumia Rusia uh, at her, um, it's a Russian name here, I don't know how to pronounce that, my wife would have to do that for you, but she's very sick right now. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, th this young lady here has posted a video here that I wanted to be able to share with you, a, a, a short clip of it. We will place in the uh, subject line below um, this video so you can watch it for yourself, or at least I'll give you right to this lady's uh, Twitter account where you can see the video. Uh, it's the truth about Crimea returning to Russia. Yuri Mishin and Manita Mishina uh, are two eyewitnesses and participants in the referendum that happened uh, when Russia gave the Crimeans their, their own right to be able to choose if they wanted to come back in as part of Russia or not. I listened to it myself. It is a very powerful interview. They both speak English, so it makes it nicer. Uh, although it is broken English, it is, it is very interesting to listen to what they have to say. I'm going to play just a, uh, about a minute of this for you to be able to hear a little bit about what they have to say about uh, uh, being part of Russia, which I can tell you they're very pro for Russia, and, uh, and they clearly define that it was the Crimean people that chose to do the referendum, which is believable because in 1991 the Crimean people also voted to secede from Ukraine, but the Ukrainian government would not allow it. Uh, listen to this here just for your own sake to hear what they have to say. Emergency stop somewhere in the step zone. The emergency stop and they just fled away. So in Sevastopol, all these people came up for the third defense of Sevastopol. Yeah, what, it was what do you mean the third defense of Sevastopol? Uh, you know, the first Crimean War, second World War defense, and we expected that it would be war. Because the slogans of radical people in Ukraine, they were very aggressive, very... So they wish us only death. We kill you. Yuri was in this list. Yuri was, his, uh, his name was. So, and they called him and said... My friend from Ukraine, from uh, Malin, Khmelnytsky city, Vinitsa city, Lviv city, uh, say me, if you go to... Russia. Ra not to... Uh, Ukraine. Say, uh, Ukraine. We kill you. Yeah, it yeah. was like this. I will kill you. Oh. Yeah. It was I, direct... I now, let me just comment real quick on this, and I'm going to move it forward. I don't know if I, I didn't mark where the other place was that I want you to be able to hear for sure on this. When she talks about, and, and Yuri here talks about that the Ukrainians said that they would kill him if he comes there, and it was actually his own friend threatening him, uh, and that he's actually on a death list for him to be killed. I know this firsthand. I have a good friend of mine who is from Ukraine as well, uh, and because that his brother, and he shared with me that his brother had a lot of business uh, that he worked inside Crimea, uh, but he was not pro-Russian side. He is the pro-Ukrainian side. And he told me, he said, Steve, quite frankly, because of the businesses that my uh, brother lost as a result of uh, Ukraine uh, doing the referendum and seceding from Ukraine, he said, my brother would be is the type of guy, he said, and I know he's got a lot of anger built up in him towards the Russians for doing this, that he would take and put a bullet in their head. Uh, so I, I have heard this myself. Let's listen to just a little bit more of this. No. People went uh, out, they didn't know what to do, how to come back to Russia and what to do, but there were always uh, some clever people around and mm. they organized it. Local people, no, Sevastopol you know. people. You know. Not Putin, no militaries, no, 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 no. But you know, America said Putin invaded and Putin took Crimea back, that's the propaganda, and then America put sanctions. Yes, on I know, Crimea. but it's not fair. What have the sanctions done? What effect have they had on Crimea? What, what does it do? There were some stupid sanctions, some uh, serious. Uh, first sanction was they uh, closed, Americans closed all uh, 
McDonald's in the Crimea. The first, I'm just no, sure. It was the first, yeah, first. The That's second, a good thing to get rid of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the se second one, uh, we are not allowed to watch any Hollywood movie in the Crimea. Who says? Cinema. No, but who? That's one of the sanctions. It's anti sanction. Our anti sanction. No, no, no. It's not anti sanction. From people, not for, from government. Oh. It is from people. What do you want, Americans? We was and will friend. Because Yalta conference, President Roosevelt. I will just post a link in here for you guys. It's really important that you watch this entire testimony here. Uh, like I said, I didn't take the time to, to bring out all the points in here, but uh, it is very clear that this couple here uh, showed that the referendum was organized by the people of Sevastopol, which is the, one of the major cities there inside of uh, Crimea, and that they organized this referendum and they chose to go back. Uh, when they say that Russia invaded, again, we know this is a false accusation from, crime, from uh, Ukraine's own admission there, as we reported here on Israeli News Live just recently, the Ukrainian uh, prosecutor found the document that uh, Viktor Yanukovych, as acting president, had invited Russia in to help uh, him to deal with the growing tensions in his country that he was afraid it was about to turn into a civil war. Uh, unfortunately, President Putin did not step in to help him in time uh, but he did take and protect the people of Crimea. And in the letter uh, that the Ukrainians have brought forward and alleged that this was done by Viktor Yanukovych, which actually exonerates uh, Russia as an aggressor in this case here, because Viktor Yanukovych, as acting president of Ukraine, had invited Russia in for protection and help to put down the coup and to stop it. I think President Putin, though, had refused to, to deal with the coup there. He had put it back on Yanukovych to deal with that part himself. But Crimea, because he knew that it was majority of the Russian-speaking people there, uh, he was willing to help with Crimea. And, of course, as we know, he has militarily backed uh, the people of eastern Ukraine. One other thing that I do want to bring out on the news here, I didn't, I didn't have it here today. I saw it the other day, and I forgot to bring it up. Uh, but there has been a, uh, a bombshell that was dropped in eastern Ukraine that is the exact same type of missile that was used to take down the uh, MH, uh, what is that, the MH17 flight that was flying over Ukraine that was blamed on the separatists, and the Ukrainians had claimed that they never had this type of Mitchell missile launching system. Well, that missile was used by the Ukrainian government just recently and alleged by the uh, separatists uh, that proves that they do have the, it's the same type of weapon systems. It could have easily been the one that took out, took out the MH17 flight over Ukraine. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.